On October 31st, 1517, the Protestant Reformation began when a German teacher and a monk named Martin Luther challenged the Catholic Church. He did this by publishing a document called Disputations on the Power of Indulgence. For many people, especially people in the United States of America, the Protestant Reformation was one of the most important historical events to occur. However, what if I told you that this was not the first time that there had been a Protestant Reformation? And what if I told you there was a Jesus who existed long before the biblical Jesus? What if I told you there was a cult so mysterious that scholars today are still trying to figure out exactly what they believed? But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. If you would like to join our patron and our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on Mystery Monday, we're going to be talking about the Orphic Mystery Cult. The story of Orpheus, and more importantly, the Orphic Mystery Schools, or Orphism, frankly has to be one of the most fascinating topics that I have researched yet. Now, to be fair, to do a very thorough job of this topic, this video would probably end up being five hours long. And so what I'm going to go through in this video is basically the basics of what we know about the Orphic religion. With that being said, if you do do your own research, which I hope you do on this topic, you will notice that many scholars are still uncertain about some of the beliefs in the Orphic Mystery Schools. All we know for sure about the Orphic Mystery Schools or Mystery Cults is that they mirror the church almost identically to this day. In fact, the Orphic religion is believed by scholars to be the foundation of all Abrahamic religions, that is, of course, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, and also is the origin story for Mithraism, which, of course, was big with Constantine at the Council of Nicaea. Now, before we get into this topic, there is something that I wanted to address. On one of my past videos regarding these mystery schools, somebody commented that um, I Basically, I'm paraphrasing that obviously I wasn't that intelligent if I believed the Hellenistic world existed. I deleted the comment because that comment obviously was very aggressive and very abusive. And so I want to make something very, very, very clear. I don't believe I ever actually mentioned the Hellenistic world when we were talking about Dionysus last week. Now, yes, it is true. As far as the Roman Empire goes, as far as the Hellenistic world, if you will, I'm not so certain that these time periods actually existed, especially with the new information on Tartaria. If you're new to this channel, that might sound shocking, but just bear with me. With that being said, we do know that our time periods, our dates are not what they should be. We, we understand that. However, just because a time period might not have existed as they tell us it existed does not mean that certain events did not happen. Two things get to be true here. The Hellenistic world might not have existed, but the cult of Dionysus, the Ulyssian mystery schools, and the Orphic mystery schools did happen. 
Now, the thing too about being an intelligent person, as Aristotle says, and we'll be talking about Aristotle soon, it's a sign of an intelligent mind when you could entertain an idea without accepting it. Part of growth and expansion is to constantly be at a place where you are challenging your own opinions. If you hold so strongly to this idea that your opinions are the ultimate truth, then you are on the path to death because truth, my friends, is infinite. And I, for one, am a seeker. I, for one, am able to accept that my opinions over time on certain topics might change. And they have changed. And thank God for that. So when we're talking about things that happened in the quote-unquote Hellenistic world, according to modern day scholars, again, does not mean that everything is made up. In fact, there's overwhelming evidence that the Dionysian schools, the you know Council of Nicaea, the Orphic Mystery Schools, that these things really did occur. It's just understanding for us when they occurred. And I don't think we're going to have that full knowledge until we have the full knowledge. So for right now, as far as time periods go, that's just speculation. But time periods for me are not what I'm interested in. I don't care if this happened, if there was a Hellenistic world that this happened in, or if this was something that happened before the fall of Atlantis, or if this was something that happened during the tribulation. That's not what matters to me because we don't have significant evidence to say when it actually occurred. What matters to me is the crux of these teachings and what human beings were doing as a result of these teachings. They say that history is bound to repeat itself. And that's something that we don't want to see happen. We don't want to see the sickness of these mystery schools to continue. At this point, the only mystery school that I actually like, as I've said many times, is the Ulyssian Mystery School, because the Ulyssian Mystery School was in exact opposition to the Dionysian School as well as the Orphic Mystery Schools. Within the Dionysian Schools and the Orphic Schools, you're looking at external validation for your own salvation, which is very, very, very much a part of the Christian church today. However, with the Ulyssian Mystery Schools, it was all about going within yourself to heal yourself. And if you've missed both of those prior episodes, I will place them down in the description box below. And so they say opinions are like assholes. We all have one and they all stink. So with that being said, I would again remind you guys that we need to be respectful in the comment section when we are discussing these topics. I also want to bring up the idea of censorship being a two-way street. We know that there is censorship from the controllers outwardly blocking information, shadow banning information, but there's also the prison of belief that turns into censorship too. And so if you're not willing to look at something because there's one part of that something that you don't agree with, then my friends, you've censored yourself. You, you, don't, you don't need the controllers because you're controlling what you know. It's just like Christians today won't look at the missing books of the Bible because they, they censor themselves. And so I would really, really hope that each of you guys would have enough self-respect to actually look at things and actually challenge your own thoughts and challenge your own opinions. That's what being a researcher means. That's what being a scientist means. Science is always doubting its own science. Science is always challenging itself. We should always be challenging our expansion of knowledge. And I will reiterate one more time, just because someone like me might not believe right now that the Hellenistic world existed, doesn't mean that I don't believe that the events that were categorized as being Hellenistic didn't happen. I believe that they did happen, especially since there's overwhelming evidence to show us that this is the case. Once again, when it happened, that's up for debate. But that's not the important part. The important part is what happened. So with that being said, let's get into the Orphic mystery cult. Now, Orphis 
Orpheism or the Orphic mystery cult is believed to be a reformation of the cult of Dionysus. Again, that video will be down in the description box below. And once again, I will reiterate, like I did in the Dionysian video, different accents are going to say these Greek names in different ways. None are right and none are wrong. In fact, I laughed in last week's video thinking that if someone from this time were to able to come back and talk to us, they would probably tell us we were all pronouncing it wrong. So again, please no comments about accents. It's just splitting hairs. It means nothing. It's just you projecting anger issues onto somebody else. It's no big deal. So again, the Orphic mystery cult was a reformation of the cult of Dionysus, just like Protestantism was a reformation of the Catholic Church. And even though we know that Dionysus himself is considered to be Jesus or of Zeus, of Satan, Orphus literally had more of the Jesus story than Dionysus did. And of course, Orphus more morphed into Mithra, which we've talked about Mithraism a lot on this channel. But the big difference between Orphus and Dionysus and Mithra is that a lot of historians, especially back in this time, believed that Orphus was a real human man who really walked this earth. Sounds familiar, right? There's many scholars who debate on whether Jesus was a real man who walked this earth or was just a collective consciousness of many humans. Now, again, I want to specify that when I say Jesus, I'm referring to the character created in the church from Orpheism and Mithraism. I'm not referring to Yahshua. Yahshua ben Yosef was a totally different person, the real teaching teacher of the Christ. So if Orphus really lived, and if the time periods are accurate, which is still questionable, the Orphic mystery schools probably started around the 7th century BC, which means that Orphus himself lived long before the Trojan War even started. Now, whether Orphus was a real live human being or not, really doesn't matter to me. I just think it's interesting because it's mirroring the Jesus to debate today. According to Britannica, Orphus is the ancient Greek legendary hero endowed with superhuman musical skills. He became the patron of a religious movement based on a sacred writing said to be his. He was known as a poet and to most a prophet. It is said that his music is so powerful it can enchant and spell cast anything, even causing nature to bend to his will. Some believe that he was the founder of modern medicine, that he practiced magical arts, practiced astrology, and he found cults dedicated to Apollo, the sun god, as well as Dionysus. He, of course, would go on to create his own cult and mystery rites, which are preserved in the Orphic texts. Now, it is possible that if we're referring to a man who really lived a long time ago, it could be that his essence, his humanness, was exaggerated into a tall tale. Over time, the magical, whimsy powers of Orpheus could have just really grown and grown and grown to become something of a spectacle. But amongst all the Greek historians and philosophers, all of them pretty much believed that this person really did exist, except for Aristotle. Like me some Aristotle, again, that quote, it's a sign of, intelli of an intelligent mind when you can entertain an idea without accepting it. So I would assume that our Aristotle did entertain the idea that Orpheus was a real person, but he firmly believed that this was all just a, a an old wives tale, a, 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 a theory, a, a, a created human being that never really walked the earth. Strabo, on the other hand, was a Greek geography historian and more famously a philosopher who lived between 64 BC and 24 AD. Strabo was one who believed Orpheus to be a real person who probably lived near Olympus. 
He believed that as a human, Orpheus made money off of his music and his wizardly skills. I kind of laugh at that wizardly skills. Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> like, did they consider astrology to be wizardly skills? Because if that's the case, then I know a lot of wizards <laughs> in my life. And again, I want to reiterate that a lot of these tools like astrology, channeling, all that kind of stuff, these tools aren't inherently bad. And again, as I say, almost every video, darkness cannot create anything. The only thing that can create is the light. The only thing darkness can do is steal from the light and, and invert it. So things like astrology, channeling, these are just tools. It's like my teacher in India says a lot, the knife. You can use a knife to cut up fruit to serve your friends and family food, or you can use a knife to kill someone. The knife doesn't change. It's the person using the knife and the intention behind it that creates the karma of that action. So just the fact that he practiced magical arts and astrology and wizardly skills doesn't really give us any indication of whether Orpheus was a good person or a bad person. And it certainly doesn't tell us whether he really lived or not. Now they say Here's the kicker. They say that Orpheus died at a Dionysian monastery or temple, and he was literally murdered there as a sacrifice through his initiation to Dionysus. Sounds a little bit like Jesus, doesn't it? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Interesting. Andre Ballinger was a French professor of literature, and he is quoted as saying, the most characteristics of Orpheism is the consciousness of sin, the need of purification and redemption, plus infernal punishment. Sounds very familiar to most Baptist churches today. That if you don't agree to a particular equation about how to save your mortal soul, then you're going to, you know, spend eternity in hell and eternal fire. Now, most people are familiar with Orpheus from his love story with Eurydice. Now, again, this is another name that I've heard pronounced multiple ways. I've heard some people call her Eurydice. I've heard some people call her Eurydice. We're going to stick with Eurydice because that's way more fun to say. Now, another thing about Orpheus when he was going about his life and, and starting this love story with Eurydice is the lineage of his birth. Because it is believed that Orpheus was born to a king and a muse named Calipe. And this particular muse was famous throughout the lands of being like an epic poet. So seems like he must have gotten his talents and abilities from his mama. And of course, if his father truly was a king, then he had some sort of value to his lineage. Now, again, I want to make this clear. When we look at societies where there is a hierarchy, where there are some humans that are considered to be more valuable than other humans, like royalty, it's a pecking order, then we are looking at a template for a negative, negatively polarized society. According to the law of one, having a pecking order, having a king, a queen, elites, all that kind of stuff is 100% the side of of satan of de demons of darkness whatever you want to call that vocabulary world word in this game of polarity on the positive side the light side of spirituality there is no pecking order it's what you call a social memory complex where every single living being is equal to the other and recognized as equal to the other now i know that's a hard concept for us here on earth because it seems like we've always had some sort of a hierarchy within our system but i will say as most of us watching know this idea of a hierarchy of royalty has not served us well. And so maybe going forward, it would be better to try the social memory complex template and see how prosperous we can be. But nonetheless, at this time, if, if Orpheus was the son of a king, he was obviously regarded as, as the king of kings, as this regal bloodline, which again makes 
his stories that much more magnetized and also resembles that of Jesus. Because in the Christian faith, you're taught that Jesus mm -hmm. was the Son of God. So therefore, Jesus himself, like Orpheus, was the ultimate sacrifice, the spilled blood of an elite person. But back to Orpheus and Eurydice. Because again of, of Orpheus's status, this was like uh, the wedding of the century, a la Kate Middleton and Prince William. But unfortunately for Orpheus and Eurydice, there was way more drama at their wedding than there was at the wedding of William and Kate. Because you see, at their wedding, Eurydice was outside in nature mm -hmm. getting ready to get married. You know, outdoor weddings must have been a theme back then too, just like they are now. Although, Lord have mercy, I would probably never get married outside in the South because that just seems like living hell because it's so fucking hot here that I think my hair and makeup would melt before I even got a chance to walk down the aisle. But for Eurydice and Orpheus, the outdoor wedding event was what they picked or what she picked. And so she's in the woods at her wedding when, lo and behold, a satyr approaches her. Now, a satyr is like the combination of a man and a horse. And if that's not scary enough, this satyr has a permanent erection. So, as any normal person would do, seeing this horrific looking being with a one-eyed monster coming at her she starts to run to try to escape and in her escape she falls into a pit of vipers one of the vipers ends up biting her on the ankle and she dies obviously once orpheus has realized that his bride has left him at the altar he goes to look for her where he finds her dead Sounds like this would have made a very interesting dateline in modern times. When Orpheus finds his beloved dead, he decides that he's going to journey to the underworld to try to get her back, to resurrect her. When he gets to the underworld, he meets Hades and Persephone. Now again, if you go back to the Ulyssian Mysteries, Persephone has to spend four to six months in the underworld each year, which is our winter. So. It must have been winter time when this, when this happened because Persephone is down there serving her time. When he meets Hades and Persephone, he decides to lure them into his will by playing his intoxicating music. And it works. He wins their favor. And they tell Orpheus that he can bring his, his beloved Eurydice back to the land of mortals. But there's one catch. There always is a catch, isn't there? Well, this catch was that if Orpheus is going to do this, if he's going to take Eurydice back to the land of the mortals, she is to walk behind him. Now, he cannot turn around to look at her until they've crossed into the mortal world. So he has to have faith that his beloved is behind him through the whole journey back to, to the human world. Well, Orpheus crosses the line, the finish line, into the mortal world, and he is so excited to have Eurydice back that he immediately turns around to look at her, not realizing that she has yet to cross the finish line. In that moment, Eurydice is snatched back into the underworld, and thus she is lost forever. Now, here's something really interesting. Scholars believe that this is the origin story of Lot's wife or Lot and his wife from the Bible. Now, of course, if you are familiar with the story of Lot and his wife, this is in Genesis chapters 11 through 14 and 19. Lot was the nephew of Abraham. And as he and his wife and family were being led out of Sodom, they were told not to look back. But Lot's wife decides to look back, and when doing so, she vaporizes into dust and sand. So to me, this does speak of a god that's more Luciferian. And I, I talked about this a lot with my deep dive into the Bible and biblical principles. When we look at the god of the Bible, we're looking at a very jealous, 
very um, temperamental God who is only satiated when he finally gets the ultimate sacrifice of human blood. This is why sacrifices are required. This is why in the Old Testament, especially a lot of the characters of the Old Testament are doing what we call virginal burnt offerings, which are children, the offerings of, of to Moloch, which Moloch we know from the missing books is Yahweh. The real God, the God of life and creation doesn't need sacrifices because again, the light is what creates. To have to do sacrifices, to have to put up with vengeance and jealousy, you're working with a God who can't create. That's why sacrifices were required, so that that God could keep his life force up by stealing from other beings created by the light. So for me, this is just more evidence that the Christian church, again, ain't nothing but Satanism with a bow on it. Because my God, the God I worship, would never ask for anything like a human sacrifice or an animal sacrifice and would certainly never traumatize you by seeing your beloved dissolve into dust because they simply turned around. But nonetheless, that is pretty much what we know about Orpheus. Now, when we get to the Orphic mystery cult, this is what we know that they probably believed. They believed that Orpheus was, as a human being, was the reincarnate or was the incarnate of Dionysus. Interesting, right? So he is God on earth, and the end of his life was a sacrifice at the temple. Again, identical to the way that the church teaches the Jesus story. And again, Jesus means of Zeus or of Satan. And Orpheus was the incarnation of that energy of Dionysus and Zeus. As the cult conjected. But before we go any further, just a brief message from our awesome sponsors, ASEA. Without ASEA and our patrons, this channel would not be possible. So a huge thank you to those that make this channel free and available to all you awesome viewers watching right now. My Uncle Dan used to talk about QTR. QTR meant for him quality time remaining. My Uncle Dan was a very active cyclist and a very avid hiker. And after he retired, after a long career, he decided that he really wanted to make the most of the years he had left where there was quality to his life before the aging process really limited his ability to enjoy things like cycling and hiking. Unfortunately, my Uncle Dan did lose his battle to cancer back in 2019, but when I was first introduced to the ASEA product, all I kept thinking about was my Uncle Dan and his concoction post-retirement of quality time remaining. As human beings, we've been taught that as our body starts to age, we eventually have to start giving up some of the activities that we enjoyed. For my uncle, that was cycling and hiking. With the ASEA supplement, what this product does is it restores signaling back into the body. Signaling, our communication between the cells of the body, is what actually allows the aging process to happen. Your body is designed by nature, by God, whatever you want to call that higher consciousness, it's designed to heal itself. That's why the cells communicate. That's why you have an immune system. But unfortunately, as we become conditioned to the toxins of this world, that immune system and that signaling system start to wear down. When our body loses signaling, that's what causes wrinkles. That's what causes cellulite. That's what causes the hair to gray. And for men, 
that's potentially what causes hair loss. As Dr. Silverman has used as an example, when we are a child and we fall off of our bicycle and skin our knees, our recovery time is pretty quick. This is because we have an abundance of redox or signaling in our bodies. But after puberty and into our adulthood, we rapidly start to lose this signaling. So if we were to fall off a bike at 80, that could mean life or death. Now for me, since I've been on the SIA now for about three months, I have noticed a tremendous amount of energy and endurance restored back to my life. As you guys all know, I am an avid exerciser. I truly believe in the power of a good sweat. And since starting the ASEA, I have noticed that my recovery time between workouts and my endurance within workouts has enhanced immensely. I'm able to go longer and harder. I've also noticed, as many of you guys have commented in the comment section, I feel like I'm getting younger or at least looking younger. No, my age keeps going up, but I look back and compare my videos now to the videos I did when I first started YouTube and I feel like I look younger now than I did then. And I do have to say that is most likely because of the ASEA. When I talked to my mother about this product, I mentioned the quality time remaining that my uncle Dan used to speak of and how with the ASEA for her as a grandmother, this product can give her the potential to have a lot longer quality time of playing in the backyard with her grandchildren. In fact, so many amazing, incredible stories can be found in comment sections of this video and on Asiya's own YouTube channel, which I will place down in the description box below. Now, we can't make any medical claims with this product as it is just a supplement. But from my perspective and from all of the um, perspectives and experiences I've read from you guys, this product has done nothing but enhance every single person's life every single person's quality time remaining, whether that be 50 years or 10 years. We see a lot of people talk about med beds, this idea of med beds. Everybody's waiting for a med bed, but what if I told you, in my opinion, the med bed is already here. With the ASEA, what it comes with, each liquid, it's a liquid, each liquid comes with its own shot glass. The shot glass is about two ounces. Each person is instructed to take between four and eight ounces a day. You take a little shot of the ASEA, you swish it around for 30 to 60 seconds so that you allow the saliva to carry the redox where it wants to carry it, and then you swallow the rest. The redox is so genius, and the creators of this product are so genius that in my opinion they really really honored and respected god's design because you see when you take the liquid redox you are allowing your body its own intelligence because the redox is just a tool it's just the signaling for your cells your cells your body is designed to heal itself and this is what helps the body to continue to heal itself and so when you take the liquid your body Body knows exactly where it needs to send the redox what part of your body is wounded what part of your body isn't so stable and so it sends the redox to that particular area so the cells in that area can start to communicate to get that particular area of the body back to where it needs to be now, of course, with this redox gel, you are able to direct the gel wherever you want it to go. So today I woke up and had a little bit of a creak in my neck. So I took the redox gel and I rubbed it on the back of my neck three times within five minutes. I personally, in my experience, automatically started to feel relief. You can also use this as a beauty supplement too. I've been using the gel on my thighs and on my boobs because yes, friends, I am 40 years old and as, as the aging process does occur, the body starts to droop a little bit. And no, I've never had children, so my boobs aren't as droopy as they could be if I had used them to feed a child, but they still are. You know, I got boobs and they, 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 they are, they're starting to sink a little bit. I also have stretch marks on my boobs that I've had my whole life because, you know, they grew. 
at some point when I was a child. So I've been taking the gel and putting them on my chest. And not only have I noticed a difference, but my boyfriend has also noticed a different difference as well. My boyfriend has been putting the gel on his head. As he is in his 50s now, he has started to notice thinning of the hair, as most men do around that age in their lives. And he is starting to grow his hair back which is quite incredible in fact i find myself now when i walk past him putting my hand in his hair just to feel all the hair that's growing back on his head you see my friends your body doesn't want to fail you it wants to keep you going it wants to keep you healthy that is how god designed it and this product is basically the controllers of this world's worst nightmare now, once again, I can't make any medical claims because this product is just a supplement. But from everything I have researched about this product, from all of the people using this product, you really can't go wrong with this product. And because this product uses the intelligence of your body, each individual person is going to start to notice different things occurring with this product. If you are interested in learning more about this product or purchasing this product, Product or even becoming a part of the business of ASEA, please text Bryce Info to 321-216-8047. Again, that's Bryce Info to 321-216-8047 and J or Hillis will get back to you as soon as possible. If you are texting from a country outside of the United States, please make sure that you add plus one. 321-216-8047 plus one is our country code. And in your text, on top of texting Bryce info, just make sure you let Jay or Hillis know that you are texting from a country outside the United States so they can arrange a call with you on WhatsApp or Signal or Zoom, any application that's not going to charge you. With that being said, another amazing thing about the SEA company is that they do offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if this product doesn't work for you or isn't what you expected after the first 30 days, they will refund you. All right, back to our show. Orpheism, again, is a set of religious practices that revolved around the literal teachings of Orpheus as this figure, as the king of kings, as the incarnate of Dionysus on earth. They would literally follow his teachings, just like the Christian church follows the teachings of Jesus. Another aspect of the Dionysian cult was that they believed Dionysus was killed and eaten by the Titans. Zeus, in his anger, strikes the Titans down, turning them to ash. Out of his ash, humanity is born. And if you remember from last week, the cult of Dionysus, they would, or Dionysus, they would rip apart children, just like Dionysus or Dionysus was ripped apart, and then they would eat the flesh, just like we do in communion. So this was a belief that traveled down from the original cult to now this new reformed cult, just like the Catholic Church taught that Jesus died for our sins, and that is uh, the main crux of the faith, which was also carried over into the Protestant faith. So again, you see how this is ironically mirroring? It's like the Protestant Reformation was just a replica of what had happened with the Orphic mystery schools coming from the cult of Dionysus, Dionysus. They believed that because of this, man has a dual nature. We have a body from the Titans and a soul from Dionysus, which is Zeus. They believed that to gain salvation, they had to first be initiated into the Dionysian mystery rites and then go through a purification process to relieve the suffering of the gods. So what do they do in churches today? They tell us to accept Jesus as our savior. And then we have to go through a baptismal process. And that is to kind of purify our own sins, which again, the original root word of sin, sin meant just to miss the mark, just to not understand who you really are. And it seems like the cult of, of Orphis or the Orphic mystery cult, they are the ones that really 
started this idea that sin was an action taken that was unpure. But with the Orphic Mystery Schools, again, it was all determined by how much you could give, the purification process you could give to this system of belief, which to me, coming from a Presbyterian church is fucking scary because you never know if you believe enough or if you believe the right way to guarantee your spot in heaven. In fact, it's kind of just like you won't know until you die, which is not what I believe at all in my life because I, again, I don't worship Lucifer. I worship the true God of love and mercy and grace. Now, the kicker too is, that's very similar to the Christian church, is that the people of the Orphic Mystery Schools believe that if they were to go through this process properly in their life, serving the Mystery Schools, serving the equation of salvation that the Mystery Schools taught, then they would get to spend eternity, get this, with Orpheus himself in heaven that God, their God, Dionysus, Zeus, had granted Orpheus his own place in heaven because after all, he is the incarnate of Dionysus. And so when you pass away, you're going to go through the pearly gates and walk the golden streets with Orpheus. My friends, this is, am I the only one that's seeing that this is identical to Christianity? which is also identical to Mithraism. Now, once more, because of the complexity of all these gods and these different rituals, there's still a lot more left to the Orphic mystery cult that scholars are still trying to figure out. And again, their opinions are constantly changing. And every single scholar I studied to prepare for this video, all of them across the board said, my opinion might change in a year because we're still learning things about this cult. But the most important discovery regarding information about this cult happened in 1962 in Dravinia, Macedonia. Divinia in Macedonia is an area in northern Greece, and at this time of 1962, there were construction workers that were trying to widen a road. And as they were trying to widen this road, they accidentally hit a grave of a nobleman that was in a buried cemetery that was originally the ancient city of Leet. This cemetery was from the 4th century, and this was the first time it had been discovered by modern people. So most of what they found as far as the artifacts were pretty well preserved. What was found in the necropolis was a manuscript that is now considered to be the oldest in the Western world. It also gave us much needed insight into the Orphic mystery schools. It's also important to note that from the Western scholar perspective, this is the only text we actually have that has itself survived from ancient Greece. All the other texts we have regarding ancient and Greeks are copies of copies of copies of copies, but this is like the original. And a bit like the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Library, the papyruses were pretty much, they were fragmented, but they were pretty much intact. And the reason why they had not spoiled with time was because of the climate. The climate in Greece helped them stay preserved a bit again like what happened in that commodity in the dead sea schools if those suckers had been hidden in where i live in georgia oh they'd be done they would dissolve because of our humid climate but in greece the dryness was able to keep them pretty well well preserved enough that we that scholars were able to get a lot of information from the fragments in the 266 fragments and 26 columns Scholars believe that the text consists of information on the instructions to be followed by the initiates of Orpheus. What makes this discovery a little bit creepy, in my opinion, and I like creepy stuff, but this was a little bit creepy, a little too creepy for me, is that the fragments were found in an urn of an incinerated man and woman, a female and male. So two bodies were in this urn with these fragments. Now, what clued the scholars off originally that this was something having to do with the Orphic Mystery Schools was the opening line of one of the fragments that read, close the door, you uninitiated. 
And this was a very famous saying. In fact, I learned through my research that Plato used to say this a lot. And we know Plato was an important figure in the early Gnostic faith, which is the original true Christian faith, not the one that the church gives you. So close the door, you uninitiated, meaning that if anybody were to read this or discover this, who wasn't initiated into these mystery schools, shouldn't be reading this information. Well, it's a good thing then that Christianity has now dominated the whole world because we've all, whether we knew it or not, have been now initiated into the Orphic Mystery Schools. My friends, that's the thing. If you grew up in a Christian church, especially a a Protestant church, you're part of the Orphic Mystery School. It was clear in these texts that they were saying that Orpheus was the savior of humanity. And he was what gained people security in the afterlife. In this text, we also see instructions on occult ritual practices. These include how to remove spirits when they've become a problem. And if you guys remember from the cult of Dionysus, they uh, wanted to be possessed by spirits. They did certain rituals to become possessed by spirits. So I guess at this point, if the um, spirit that you've invited in has overstayed its welcome, well, now we know how to get rid of it. We don't need it anymore, right? We've got all the riches. We've got everything we need. Look, the Catholic Church is the richest corporation in the world. So we don't need that spirit anymore. So here's how you're going to get rid of it. It also talked about how to properly do sacrifices to Uranus, who is the goddess of vengeance. What's that quote from the Bible? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. What Lord are we talking about in the Bible now? That's my question. It also talked about there should be a strong belief in the Magi. Now, many of you know what Magi are. We hear the Magi from the birth of Jesus, the Christmas story where the three wise men, the Magi, came to visit to give Jesus, Zeus, gifts. These Magi were famous wizards, magicians, and priests of Mithraism, which again, Mithraism is Orpheism. They're one and the same. This text also from what people, scholars have said, talks about the many rapes of Zeus, how Zeus was just going around raping women. We again saw this kind of in the Dionysian text where he was a little perv who was spying on Semele. And if we look at the virgin birth story, which we know from the missing gospels, the missing books of the Bible, that Yahshua was born of Alma Mari, whom they call Mary, and Yosef, or Joseph, He was born of both parents, which is the natural creation of life, which in itself is a beautiful miracle. The story, though, that we're taught at church, where Mary has no consent, where she's just told now that, boom, she's pregnant, that's a story of a demonic ritual. Kind of, again, like that scene they cut out of Eyes Wide Shut, where a woman is raped by a demon in order to give birth to demigods because consent is necessary in a positively polarized world consent is necessary so the birth of yashua was done through loving consent of two humans who loved each other but jesus was done by a a spiritual rape of of mary again her real name was alma mari do you guys see where i'm going with this like it's just so obvious that if you grew up christian you actually grew up Orphic or Mithraic. Now, there was one scholar that I found to be kind of comical because he was saying how this this literature they found in this tomb, this crypt in 1962 is downright terrifying. But you know what? At least it's honest. Because even though we do know that this leads into the Christian church, the Christian church isn't honest. It, it tells you the truth to your face through symbolism, through certain vocabulary words that are used, but it doesn't come right out and say it. At least in the Orphic Mystery Schools and the cult of Dionysus, they're literally coming out and telling you what you're doing. And so for that, you got to give them a little bit of respect. Even if you don't agree with what they're doing, you think it's awful and it's not correct, at least they're honest about it. Now, the Deverini Papyrus, as it came to be known, was only released to the public in 2006. 
This is because, according to many scholars, this makes sense to me. It took 44 years for them to literally figure out how to place these fragments in order. And of course, like many of the missing books of the Bible from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi Library, parts of the paper were missing. So they had to kind of figure out the gist of what was being said. It is now being kept at a museum in Greece for the public to see the original papyrus. Now, what's really fucking interesting to me, my friends, is do you know who owns that papyrus now? The UN. Just like the UN now owns Gobekli Tepe, just like it owns a lot of stuff we've covered on this channel. It's like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. The truth is going to get out and we can't have that. So we need to send our people in to confiscate this material so we can create a narrative around it that's not necessarily the truth. And so for me, someone, I, I feel like I'm a pretty intelligent person. I also feel like I have a lot of common sense. The fact that the UN now owns this papyrus means, in my opinion, allegedly, that there is even more information here that they don't want us to know. And I have a, a just a hunch that it's got more to do with the biggest religion in the world than anything else. Because as you know, if you've been on this channel for a while, if you are still going to church, if you are still believing the propaganda that they're telling you at church, then you're still asleep. You're still under the control of the matrix. And even though we know that our world has been corrupted in every single aspect of it from education to medicine, to everything, to politics, so many people who are aware of all these other all this other corruption still can't accept the fact that their religion is corrupt as well. And because of that, the cabal, the controllers, the UN still has its grips on the people. That is why, in my opinion, nothing is really flipped yet. Because the people are still consenting through their religion. They're still consenting to the control of these nefarious people. And again, that's just my opinion on the matter. Now, with that being said, again, there's so much more to all of these mystery schools. I really encourage each and every one of you, as always, to please do your own research. Do not take what I say as fact. This is my research. These are my opinions. And as I've said many times, as you can see through all my videos on this channel, my opinions in my understanding of concepts do change over time. And thank God for that, right? I'm open-minded enough to continue to look at these things. And so I encourage you to do the same thing. Continue to look at this stuff. And once again, I understand that this might be scary. I get what that's like to be taught one thing your whole life and then to find out that one thing that you've been taught is actually bad can be very, very scary. But liberation is on the other side of fear. And just know, just know, my friends, once again, that the real God, not the God of the Bible, not Zeus, not Orphus, not Jesus, but the real God, Yeshua, Magdalene, the real people who taught this beautiful teaching from the real source creator wants nothing from you, but just for you to understand that you are perfect. Even with your imperfections, even with your faults, all you're on right now is a journey. That's it. You're here for your soul to refine itself. So even though all these rituals you now know might be bad, that might be scary, it's all okay because you are good just as you are. Keep working on yourself. Keep strengthening your connection to the divine because at the end of the day, the divine is what you are. You are a beautiful fractal of God and no Orpheus no Zeus, no fucked up religion can ever take that away from you. You, my friends, are the child of the Most High, and don't ever forget that. All right, you guys, once again, join us at 10 o'clock this morning over on Aquarius Rising Africa, where we're going to be doing a live discussion of the Orphic Mystery Schools. I will be away next week, so I will not be on Aquarius Rising Africa next week, but I am working on a little Monday mystery just for shits and giggles and for fun to give you guys something, some entertainment while I'm away. 
As always, leave me your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. Please remember to be once again respectful. If somebody has a different opinion than you, it does not mean that they're not as smart as you. It just means they have a different perspective. And hearing people's different perspectives is how we all learn. If we're too arrogant to even question our own opinions, then humanity as a whole is done. So always remember, again, as Aristotle said, Aristotle, the one that did not believe Orpheus ever lived, as he said, it is a sign of an intelligent mind when you can entertain an idea without accepting it. All right, you guys have a wonderful Monday and I will talk to you soon.